Welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the convener of the webinar series for the International Social Capital Association. Now, the association's mission is to advance the research and application of the social capital concept and the association is now welcoming new members. In this session, we welcome Dr. Esther Carmen for, uh, from the, the James Hutton Institute for a discussion about a socio-cultural perspective for working with social relationships in community sustainability initiatives in practice, a focus on relationship qualities. Esther is an interdisciplinary, qualitative, environmental social scientist who is interested in how different social actors, such as scientific, policy, community, and business, can and do shape socio-environmental change processes. Her work focuses on advancing our understanding of how work, working with and better involve these different actors in ways that can help guide the development of more sustainable collective futures. Her PhD was undertaken at the University of York and addressed the question, how do social relationships amongst other diverse factors shape community change initiatives in the context of climate change? This led to three peer-reviewed papers with an additional uh, paper currently under review. Her current research focuses on environmental governance more broadly within Scotland and across Europe, with a focus on the involvement of the private sector for mainstreaming nature-based approaches at scale to deliver land-based and freshwater ecosystem restoration whilst addressing societal challenges. Welcome, Esther, and over to you for the presentation. Great, thanks very much, Tristan. Um, so that was a that was a, a, a very kind introduction um, and covered a lot of the detail that I've got on my first slide. Um, but I want to just really emphasise um, that I'm an environmental social scientist, and my research approach is really qualitative and it's inductive. Um, and often transdisciplinary. Um, so those two kind of um, uh, sort of that's that's the approach I've taken throughout the studies I'm going to present to you today. Um, so as uh, Tristan said, um, these studies relate to my PhD that I completed in 2021 on how social relationships among other diverse factors shape community change initiatives in the context broadly of climate change. So I'll move on swiftly. Um, so this is the talk that I'm going to give today, a social cultural perspective for working with social relationships in community sustainability initiatives in practice. And the practice bit is really quite important here. You know, we want to be able to have some practical application and really sort of um, help with solutions on the ground. So there's a real core focus here on sort of and a question really is a focus on relationship qualities. And is this a good entry point um, into working with uh, social relationships? So the contents of my uh, talk, there's going to be three sort of core um, parts to this, um, each framed around um, one of the three studies that I'm going to present. So the first one is the literature review that I undertook uh, around building community resilience in the context of climate change and looking at the role of social capital. So this was a broad review of the literature. The second part, um, I will focus on an em empirical transdisciplinary case study. So this was focusing on one community um, initiative, and it looked at the social dynamics in establishing complex community climate change initiatives and it, the focus is on the case of a community fridge in Scotland and I will explain what that means um, before diving into the into the findings. So thirdly, the last part of the talk is um, on a much broader empirical study that involved 22 community groups um, across Scotland, and it focuses on this question of is, does the quality of relationships matter and really how to work with them if they do. Um, I'll finish up with some sort of key messages and then we'll sort of go into a, a sort of question and answer sort of discussion session. So that's the broad structure of the talk. So before I dive into um, uh, th those three sections, I just want to broadly sort of set out some key uh, definitions. And Tristan kindly sent me some questions that some of you had submitted beforehand. And um, this really made me realize that sort of uh, being a bit clear about my definitions was probably a, a useful way to channel discussions. So by community resilience, I'm sort of very broadly, simplistically talking about collective capacity to thrive in the context of constant change. So it's more of a kind of social resilience definition definition, um, but it is drawing on the socio-ecological systems kind of um, definitions of resilience as well. So understanding community as a socio-ecological system. 
So some of the previous research I've done, um, we've sort of uh, clarified some of the key elements in the context of climate change for resilience, community resilience building. So I just wanted to kind of set out my stall quite quickly and early on. Um, this is how I understand community resilience. So it's about adaptability and flexibility um, and drawing on different resources and capacities. It's about shocks and stresses. Um, it's about direct and indirect foreseen and unforeseen changes. I know this is where the complex adaptive system perspective comes in. Um, it's about including diverse perspectives and connecting horizontally to um, identify sort of synergistic solutions. Um, but it's also about connecting vertically as well across those social levels. So engaging with the more um, formal spaces um, and um, more formal organizations to sort of um, enhance resilience um, and sort of you know, develop collective action and collaborative action. It's about engaging with transformative action to proactively reduce carbon emissions in, in the context of climate change, but really this is about the underlying drivers. Community resilience is about um, not just dealing with the uh, impacts, it's about sort of um, action that helps contribute to sort of addressing those underlying drivers of those changes. Um, it's about creating hope and inspiring action. Um, this is a really sort of important aspect to that community agency or the collective agency, you know, the, the sort of belief that they can um, and willingness to engage in, in collective action. It's also about envisaging alternative futures. Um, so um, using creativity and imagination. So um, yeah, coming up with those visions um, and thinking about what alternatives there might be um, for the community. It's about climate disadvantage and reducing inequality. So this is a sort of social justice dimension um, of really considering who um, is involved, who's benefiting, how, um, and really sort of uh, speaking to all the different types of social groups that you find within a community. It's also about meaningful participation and learning and empowering those kind of uh, different social groups. So it's really bringing people together to collectively puzzle and reflect and learn and uh, sort of move forward. And finally, the really important bit um, is the uh, opportunity for transformative change. So it's not just about tweaking or sort of, um, you know, uh, working with the existing conditions. It's really about thinking about what can um, emerge and, and be brought into, into being. Um, that might be radically different. It doesn't necessarily have to involve radical change, but there's the potential for radical change. So moving on, I also talk about community sustainability initiatives. And very briefly, what I mean by these is these are initiatives that are driven by actors based within the community. So these are groups of actors, um, you know, individuals from the community who collectively come together to decide um, and progress a particular um, objective. And, and the aim of these initiatives is really about local challenges, so socioeconomic and or environmental challenges. So it's quite a broad understanding of sustainability here. So in terms of social relationships, what I'm talking about here is the, these um, sort of spaces that co-develop over time um, as, as actors interact together. Um, they're dynamic spaces shaped by multiple interconnected social cultural factors. OK, so they're relational spaces, they're dynamic um, and they guide how information, ideas, actions and actors are interpreted within those spaces and as those actors leave those spaces. Um, so it really helps to shape how actions or interactions unfold through time, um, as I said, within those spaces, but also as actors, um, you know, um, engage more broadly in the social context. So another concept I use later on in the talk is human agency. And what I mean by this is a commitment and willingness and ability to act to pursue a particular goal. So individually or, you know, collectively. Um, and this shapes how actors relate to the wider social context. OK, so those are sort of some of the key definitions I'll be using in this talk. So moving on to the first um, section of the talk, this relates to uh, this uh, literature review I undertook um, about building community resilience in the context of climate change, and the focus is on the role of social capital. So this is an open access paper. Um, uh, if anyone does have any problems accessing it, please let me know, but it should be available to all. Um, and it was published in Ambio in 2022. So the aims of of this study, well, it was a qualitative meta synthesis and it focused on what the, does the literature already tell us 
overall about the role of social capital and community resilience. So broadly, I looked at um, and identified uh, 187 peer reviewed studies that were focusing on social capital and resilience. So the first sort of sweep of the literature um, identified lots more um, studies and we reduced it down to this 187 um, based on their focus on social capital and resilience um, beyond the individual level. So the analysis um, that I undertook of these studies um, focused on some key areas. So firstly, it focused on conceptual understandings of each of the concept, and then conceptual understandings about social capital and how it relates to community resilience. Then secondly, I looked at empirical understanding. So what do we know in, from the empirical data and the empirical findings on how social capital relates to resilience? And finally, identified um, from this um, some core research gaps um, to sort of inform future research. So um, this is quite a, a busy slide, so my apologies, but it bro broadly sort of represents um, uh, the, the conceptual understandings um, that were identified from these, this literature review. So first and foremost, conceptual understandings of social capital. There were four different conceptual understandings. The first was sort of broadly just social networks and the presence of social networks, those sort of connections between actors. The second type of conceptual understanding of social capital was those kind of social networks, those connections and, and the outcomes that came from those connections. The third um, definition of the conceptualization of social capital had a stronger emphasis on those elements of trust and reciproc reciprocity. Um, so it included those connections, but also highlighted the importance of those kind of uh, core dimensions of trust. Um, and finally, the, 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 third, the fourth uh, conceptualization of social capital looked at those sort of social networks, those social connections, but also had an emphasis explicitly on the social cultural dimensions involved in shaping those connections and what emerged from them, um, and really sort of understood social capital as a really sort of embedded um, uh, you know, set of connections within a particular context. So I also looked at the conceptualizations of resilience and anyone familiar with the resilience literature, um, this will be sort of broadly quite familiar and maybe slightly different um, uh, sort of wordings and terms. But broadly speaking, we had re reactive resilience, which was really about the sort of coping resilience. It was the, the de dealing um, in the immediate aftermath of shocks um, and sort of, you know, just uh, uh, yeah, coping with impacts that, that, that sort of hit the community. So the aim here is really to return to the status quo as quickly as possible. Um, then the had this kind of responsive resilience, and this is more of a slightly more adaptive kind of understanding. Um, there is learning involved in this um, from the shock. So it's dealing with the shocks and then tweaking and learning afterwards. Um, but really still the, the, the aim is to improve the existing system. And then the third um, understanding of resilience identified within this body of literature was what I term proactive resilience. So this is more um, of a sort of ongoing process of anticipation, reflection, experimentation and learning. It's about sort of, you know, that anticipation of challenges um, and, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, bringing things together and sort of experimenting with new ways of, of, of sort of uh, bringing people together and developing up capacities. So it's really taking a systems perspective. And here it's about um, shaping the future, a sort of long term views um, about the system and how to get it on a more sustainable trajectory. So from these sort of different conceptualizations, I identified six different roles of social capital. So this is how does the social capital inform resilience? Um, again, but this is based on sort of conceptualizations within this body of literature. So the first was really um, the role of social capital was really focusing on the network quantity. So the quantity of social connections was really important for reactive resilience. So that coping. So the more connections, the better, uh, broadly speaking. Speaking. Now, the second conceptual role um, was about the diversity of social connections. So this starts to recognize the role of, um, uh, and I'm sure this will be familiar with a lot of the audience, sort of bonding and bridging types of social capital, the different types of connections, and that, you know, uh, the diversity is needed. So it's not just one type of connection that's important. Now, these were associated with sort of, you know, uh, more sort of social network um, kind of perspectives on social capital. 
Um, but moving on to the slightly uh, broader understandings of social capital that recognize trust and reciprocity, the third conceptual role was about balancing multiple capitals. So this is about not just social capital, but it's about social how social capital interacts with other capitals to then inform um, sort of more adaptive forms of resilience, this responsive resilience. So yeah, social capital is important, but insufficient. So it's how these things interact. The fourth role, um, conceptual role identified, was really focusing around the formal organizations and their importance in um, facilitating and um, the connections um, with community to really support that learning and adaptive process and that responsive resilience. The fifth conceptual role identified was about the slow changing variables. So these are social capital uh, you know, being one of these variables that changes slowly over time, um, along with um, human capital and cultural capital. And it was really focusing on the, the longer timeframes and how these things interact over, over time to kind of shape um, resilience. And this was starting to really uh, focus much more so on the sort of more proactive forms of resilience. So how um, social capital um, changes slowly with other variables to shape, you know, this process of ant anticipation, reflection, you know, the capacity to experiment, the learning that comes out of these processes. Um, so again, this just emphasis on the slightly longer timeframes. And then finally, um, the, the, the sixth conceptual role identified was really focusing on these social cultural factors. So it connects these social cultural factors within the relational spaces with the social cultural factors really that um, influence proactive resilience and how uh, communities go about pursuing this. You know, as, as again, you know, as I emphasize, you know, how do these things, um, uh, social cultural factors influence who comes together to experiment, what kind of experiment happens and what emerges from that you know and that approach of anticipation and you know what kind of futures might be foreseen um, it's all about those kind of social cultural factors and by social cultural factors what I really mean here is um, values identities beliefs norms traditions those kind of less tangible um, factors that you find um, within communities that really do kind of uh, shape you know who's involved how are they involved what's emerging from collective action processes so that was the conceptual understandings that were identified in this body of literature and as I said, I'd just like to emphasize this sort of social cultural aspect um, that's really come out. Um, so there was an awful lot of uh, literature that, that really focused on conceptualizations of social capital that are more about the connections, the kind of the networks and, and uh, sort of the network quality, the network diversity, you know, the type of connections that um, are involved, you know, that connect different actors together. Um, but really the social cultural aspects, although they were there and um, they were kind of underplayed quite a lot within the conceptualizations and there's very um, the majority of the literature did focus on these other forms of resilience and these sort of other um, sort of more uh, structural aspects of social capital so the social cultural dimensions and this kind of proactive sort of uh, resilience was really um, underplayed within the literature so it was there but predominantly um, that studies focused on on sort of other um, conceptualizations so that's an interesting gap. So I then looked at the empirical insights that are coming out of this body of literature. Um, and, and there are um, sort of three kind of main themes that identified sort of very broad areas um, of empirical findings. So the first related to the role of social capital in influencing resilience. The second was about the factors that interact with social capital to influence resilience. And the third was the influence of formal institutions in shaping the role of social capital for resilience. So I'm just going to very briefly go through these. Um, I'm not going to um, sort of uh, go through the whole table that is pre presented on this slide. You can find these in the paper um, uh, uh, of this study um, to sort of go through in, in, in sort of more depth but I've highlighted a few key aspects I want to draw your attention to, okay? 
So the role of social capital in influencing community resilience, there was an awful lot of focus on this reactive and um, responsive kind of uh, uh, forms of resilience. As again, as said, the kind of structural dimensions were really strong, sort of the bonding and the bridging kind of um, aspects um, of social capital. Um, but increasingly in some areas, there was um, some of the empirical findings really highlighted the perceptions of unequal access um, to resources can cause distrust and loss of social capital. So this is how, um, uh, particularly in times when resources are scarce, um, you know, that that can happen through social capital, it can actually create, you know, distrust um, and potential for conflict. However, you know, the buffer for this is the norms of community support. So those cultural aspects, social cultural aspects, if there's the norms of community support already in the context, within the community, this reduces the likelihood for this kind of distrust um, to erode social capital. Um, so again, also the, there was a finding related to social capital can facilitate learning. And I'm sure this is um, uh, not news to this audience who are very familiar with the social capital literature. Um, but also within this was that norms of inclusion and exclusion um, really influenced who was involved in that learning process um, and, and sort of you know, what was, was taken up, what kind of learning was emerging. Um, so this is the key kind of um, thing I'd like to get across from this is that there was some aspects of social cultural dimensions within this theme, um, but it wasn't, it, it was sort of interdispersed and it was a kind of supplementary um, sort of um, finding often within um, empirical studies. So moving on to the, the second theme from the empirical um, uh, studies, this, this one was around the factors that interact with social capital to influence resilience. So this is about those kind of other factors involved in, in shaping resilience. And again, um, a lot of these findings are not going to be, um, you know, news to to um, many of, of social capital scholars. These are, you know, are broadly found across the the, the body of literature. Um, and again, it sort of relates to um, the slow and fast changing factors that interact with social capital. Um, you know, social capital is necessary but insufficient. Um, uh, there's combinations of other resources that really shape resilience and, and, and they're found in different combinations within different social settings um, and relevance to different objectives within community initiatives. Um, and also this dynamic aspect, of social capital, social capital shifts, it's quite a dynamic resource. Um, so it can change over time and how it sort of, you know, the role in resilience, um, you know, can therefore shift as well. Um, and, you know, it, lastly, again, as I've highlighted, there was kind of um, this, asp this focus on social cultural factors that shape collective agency to build community resilience. So these, um, you know, uh, factors relate to who comes together um, and what the, um, sort of purpose of that collective action is. Um, so again, the point is that there was an awful lot of focus on social capital and um, how social capital influences resilience through other factors. But again, the social cultural factors was there, but really not um, uh, sort of uh, dominant um, within this kind of theme. So finally, the third theme from the empirical um, insights that are identified in this review was the influence of formal institutions in shaping the role of social capital for resilience. And by formal institutions, we're talking about that kind of policy context. We're talking about formal organizations, local government, those kind of more formal organizations that are involved and, and um, help can sort of shape community resilience. So again, um, you know, there's various different um, aspects to this, um, you know, higher levels of governance are really important in those sort of higher level decisions um, and, and shaping sort of uh, not just how actors relate to each other on the ground in terms of their connections, but also in terms of the norms within those sort of relational spaces. So the actors decision, uh, high level government decisions can really influence those norms of cooperation or competition between actors um, in a, uh, within a community. So there was overlooking uh, the role of social capital can lead to missed opportunities for um, sort of more formal um, interventions looking at to build community resilience. So if you miss it, then it's you know, likely to kind of erode. Um, so really like local government actors need to kind of have a, a stronger sort of focus 
on how their activities can not erode, but also build social capital for the community um, to then be able to address their challenges and uh, sort of you know, get people involved in collective action and learning. Um, and, you know, conversely, on the flip side of that is, you know, if you focus on social capital, um, then you create opportunities to also enhance and build social capital through time. And then finally, the sort of social cultural aspects of institutions. So the cultural um, dimensions of organizations, um, the discourses, attitudes and practices of formal actors can really influence the access of social groups to how they, they are able to access resources from these um, sort of institutional, more formal spaces. So again, the focus here is that there's lots of um, focus on social connections and the social cultural dimensions come out um, but it's very much, you know, um, a supplementary um, to um, a lot of the sort of more structural uh, perspectives on social capital. So from this uh, review, um, I identified a number of critical research gaps, four, in fact. So the first is why and how outcomes emerge through social capital, not just what emerges. So there's a lot of focus on what comes out of social connections, um, but the, the why and the how these outcomes are shaped, and we know that these outcomes vary across contexts, um, is a critical research gap to kind of dig into a bit more. The dynamic interactions between different factors and social capital. So dynamic perspectives um, aren't very strong within this body of literature. A lot of the time, um, understandably so, there's a more static picture presented of the different factors. And really there's a gap to sort of um, uh, maybe address is about how these different factors do interact over time um, and um, how, how they influence each other um, and interconnect. So the third research gap where there's different ways formal organizations can shape social capital and community resilience. So this is recognizing that, you know, uh, local government um, and various other um, actors outside of the community have an influence and have a role in shaping social capital and how that can um, uh, sort of feed into community resilience initiatives. And finally, the social cultural dimensions that shape the nature and role of social capital for community resilience. So it's this real focus on these values, norms, beliefs, um, and, and those kind of less tangible aspects and really starting to understand um, you know, a bit better about how they influence these social connections, what, you know, what emerges, how things emerge, um, and, and, and how these social connections are shaped on the ground. So um, they're obviously interconnected, but those are sort of four broad research gaps identified from this review. So just to reiterate, the message that I'd like to sort of convey in this talk is within this body of literature on social capital and community resilience, there is a strong focus on structural aspects of social capital. So this structural perspective on what actors are involved and the different types of connections um, between them and, and, and sort of, you know, the flow of resources um, and outcomes that, that emerge. But there's much less focus on the social co cultural dimensions, both conceptually and empirically. OK, so what we do know suggests that the social cultural aspects are important in shaping how relationships unfold and in shaping what emerges and, and how this unfolds over time. Um, but there, you know, they, the dominant focus is on these structural aspects. So this brings me on to the second part of my talk. Um, so taking this kind of research gap around social cultural dimensions of social capital and resilience, um, I really wanted to dive into um, a, a, a single case study that really um, was unfolding um, and looked at, um, you know, I, I approached it in terms of looking at the social dynamics, what's happening, you know, what dynamic factors are interacting um, when a, a, a sort of community initiative is being established. So this is a, a, an initiative that's being developed by a team of community-based actors. Um, and the case that, I'm, uh, folk, that I focus on is a community fridge in Scotland. Okay, and again, um, this is an open access paper. It was published in Sustainability Science. If anyone has any problems accessing this, please do let me know, but it should be widely available. So briefly, community fridge, this is um, this was a new concept to me. Um, I hadn't come across a community fridge, so I thought it was worth just briefly explaining what community fridge is. Um, 
So a community fridge is um, a space, uh, whether it's a single sort of refrigerator or a, a shed type uh, sort of structure that's presented here, um, where food from sort of uh, local businesses and uh, supermarkets that would otherwise be thrown away is collected by a community group um, and provided for free for people within the community to come and take. Um, so there's no cost, there's no membership. Um, it's ac accessible to anyone who would like to come along and, um, you know, take uh, this food. So it basically is about reducing waste and reducing waste and food waste has a contribution, you know, in terms of emissions, uh, you know, waste of food waste is, is, is um, you know, a source of emissions. Um, so there's a strong focus to the community fridge is the climate change aspect, but it's also about um, making food accessible um, to people um, of all sort of wilks within the community. So whereas you have the idea of a, a food bank, which is often targeted at specific marginalized groups, and they have to gain access to the food bank and get a sort of, um, here in the UK, you have to get an approval um, to then go into a food bank. This um, is, is not sort of, um, you know, targeted at one specific group. It's open to anyone. So anyone can come along. And the advantage to this is that it has a less sort of social stigma attached to it. Um, anyone can come along and take the food and, uh, and use it. Um, so that's the core difference between a community fridge and a, a sort of a food, food bank, um, particularly you know, from, a, from a UK context. Um, so the community fridge, as I said, was a novel idea. I'd never come across it myself. Um, and in terms of Scotland and when where this uh, study is based, where this community fridge was established, this was actually the first community fridge in Scotland. So it wasn't just a novel new idea for me and something I hadn't come across. It's new to, to most people within Scotland at the time of this study. And that's quite important. So as I said, this study was undertaken in Scotland, it was actually done in Dundee, um, and the community fridge was being developed in one district of Dundee, and Dundee is a smallish uh, Scottish city on the northeast coast. Um, you know, it's broadly, broadly similar in size um, to sort of um, other uh, Scottish cities. So the aims and methods of this study, so it was a transdisciplinary case study, so I was embedded with the community team delivering, um, you know, and looking to establish this community fridge. And I was really focusing on those social and cultural aspects and how they interact um, to shape how this, this initiative unfolded. Um, so I was embedded within the, the team for about 10 months um, and I used semi-structured interviews and participant observation. So I was very much involved within um, the activities of the community of the team. Um, and so reflexivity was an incredibly important part of this research process. So in terms of the local actors involved in this research, there was 15 um, that I interviewed who uh, were selected based on their engagement with this process. Um, so that included local businesses, and that was a strong, strong group within um, the, the people I was interviewing, but also some local government officers who were involved in permissions and helping guide the process, as well as the community team involved who are really sort of driving forward this process. So through the course of um, the 10 months, I undertook 23, in, 23 interviews. So some of these actors were interviewed more than once, some of the key ones, and particularly the, the members of the team, the community team I interviewed more than once. And also a couple of local businesses were interviewed multiple times because they were really like sort of actively involved in this process. Um, and these were more sort of reflective interviews to try and sort of um, create that space for reflection and learning um, within the process. So this is again quite a busy slide, but it basically broadly represents this is the illustration of the findings of what came out. So there was three different dynamics identified through this process. The first was a degenerative dynamic. The second was a sort of realignment dynamic. And then the third dynamic uh, we've termed a regenerative dynamic. And I'm hopefully going to sort of explain this um, uh, to you. So the first phase of this community initiative, um, there was two sort of micro dynamics going on. And the first was this reinforcing interpretations that involve concepts, assumptions, and emotions. And basically this related to a local business 
who um, was informed of the development of the community fridge, um, but not provided you know, lots of information, but uh, it sort of uh, was made aware that the community fridge was gonna be established uh, in close proximity to this business. Now, um, this created um, sort of uh, some assumptions and emotions with of the business owners. They became quite fearful. They made assumptions about what a community fridge was based predominantly on their understanding of a food bank. Um, and then they started to use certain concepts and language to communicate and convey their sort of fears about the community fridge um, that were focused um, on the type of people they thought were going to be attracted to you know this area and some of these um, concepts were slightly derogatory um, you know based on their sort of um, anxiety and fear um, some of the concepts used for example were talking about undesirable people Okay, so this sort of dynamic was happening and this interacted with the dynamic of their existing connections with local um, other local business owners. Um, so they started to interact based on the sort of local um, identities of business owners. They had a connection with other business owners um, and conveyed their sort of um, their fears and use the concepts that, that they were talking about to really convey this uh, sense of fear um, and anxiety about this new um, thing that was being developed, um, you know, in close proximity to their business. So through these connections, other business owners got involved really based on those kind of norms of solidarity. We want to support our fellow, um, you know, uh, business owner, um, you know, in this local area. So those norms of solidarity and those local identities became really, really key. And what this created was a lot of tension and it started to create factions between the local business owners and the community uh, team um, sort of establishing the community fridge. So huge tensions emerged um, and it got to the point where it was so tense that it was actually very difficult to convey um, and uh, sort of hear each other's perspectives. Um, it really was entering that kind of place of conflict. So then we move on to the realignment dynamic. And what followed from this kind of degenerative dynamic, which really did reduce the quality of the relationships between the business owners and the community team. OK, so, you know, th th there was a relationship there before and with these factions and with all these sort of assumptions and, um, you know, a gathering of business owners, the quality of relationships really, really did decrease to the point where it was quite tense. So what happened then was this realignment dynamic. And what happened was that um, across the city, people became aware of uh, these tensions and these factions um, around the establishment of the community fridge. Now, this so happened to be through um, a, a, a newspaper article um, from a citywide um, uh, newspaper that was widely read um, that made uh, you know, other people within the city aware of what was happening um, and sort of highlighted a few, few points you know, simplistically um, about what, what, where those tensions were arising from. And what really happened was there was a bit of a backlash um, from other actors from across the city um, who actually um, started to really support the community fridge um, and disagree with the position that the local businesses were taking. Um, and there was uh, sort of some uh, sort of almost threats, threats coming through social media. And I mean, it got to the point where the fear and anxiety of the local businesses um, shifted from the community fridge just you know, per se, um, to what is this impact having on my business and my customers and, and customer, you know, people were saying, I'm not gonna frequent these businesses. So there was a real sense of threat coming from the, to the local businesses, but from much, much broader uh, sense of threat. Um, so this kind of, uh, you know, the, 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 the city identities, which actually the initiative design really clearly aligns with in terms of supporting people, making, you know, providing a resource for anyone to access, um, really counteracted, was, was countered by the position that the, the, the businesses were taking. Um, so um, what, what happened was the local businesses who were opposing the Community Fridge Initiative basically had to passively accept the, you know, the presence of the fridge and this was going to happen. Um, they felt um, they had no, no um, option but to accept it. 
Okay. Now, at this point, the, the, the relationships, the quality of relationships are still tense. You know, just because you're accepting something doesn't mean that um, you're overjoyed and, and happy with it. Um, and this was the position of the key uh, local businesses. So then we move on to the regenerative dynamic. And basically what happened was through this process of increased fear and anxiety of the business owners, the community um, team pushing the um, community fridge initiative actually went and engaged with these local businesses and really expressed some of the values and emotions, um, you know, their empathy uh, with the position that local businesses found themselves in. Uh, the initiative basically was looking to bring the local businesses on board and really support them as well. You know, their understanding of community was about businesses as well as lots of different aspects of community. Um, so by sh expressing this kind of empathy, it created a space to actually start listening to each other and understand each other's concerns, um, what really the community fridge was trying to um, achieve and what the team was trying to achieve and really opened up this space for learning. So this um, was a huge relief for everyone involved. Um, and then ideas started to be generated about how these two, you know, the business owners and the community team can start working together, really strengthen the local area. So their connections and sense of sort of common identity um, from within this district of the city and norms of solidarity really started to come out. So these two groups started to come together and the quality of relationships significantly enhanced to the point where, you know, the, the design of the fridge was changed slightly to sort of um, in response to some of the concerns of the business owners, but also um, the business owners were looking to then donate uh, food to the fridge. Um, so it really, so through this process, the, the sort of social relationships and, and the social cultural factors really sort of decreased the quality of the relationships. Um, and this sort of degenerated, um, uh, this degenerative dynamic, but actually through the process and through the kind of um, actions uh, of, of the local team, um, a regenerative dynamic was created. So their core values and their desire to be inclusive really created opportunities to strengthen the quality of relationships, okay? So the key messages really from this study are that social cultural factors across scales, so it's within sort of relationships, but also in the local area, but also in terms of the city, um, interacted over time to shape the role of relationships. And it did this by influencing how the initiative was viewed initially by business owners and the underlying feelings as created and the language used to communicate um, to others about the initiative. Um, the role of social relationships in galvanizing opposition, pulling the local businesses together in these sort of norms of solidarity um, to, you know, um, desire to help each other out and support each other. Um, collective support for initiative and the opposition to the businesses. Um, so who was supporting and who was opposing and, and sort of, uh, you know, those kind of aspects were really shaped by a sense of identity business identity and then a sort of local identity in terms of this district of the city and then also social cultural factors shape the opportunities for sharing learning and increase the quality of relationships as the process developed so actually what happened was the collective capacity was enhanced by the quality of relationships being enhanced because then there was these good strong quality relationships between the local businesses and the community fridge so that when if problems did arise in the future and often they do there was a capacity to come together quickly understand the problem and collectively solve the problem um, and there was a strong desire to do that so the social cultural factors shaped how the quality of relationships shifted over the process. That's a very core um, sort of message I'd like to get across. Um, and really it was about, you know, a, a, an important aspect of this was the core values embedded in the initiative. So the team's values related to wanting to include the businesses, be empathetic, you know, um, all of those kind of aspects um, and how they expressed these aspects in their interactions with local businesses really led to this increase in the quality of relationships. So from this, I can sort of uh, reiterate that 
And social relationships are more than just connections between actors. They are these kind of dynamic spaces that are shaped by different cult social cultural factors within the wider context um, and within those relational spaces. Um, and they really guide how aspects of the initiative were interpreted and the actions that sort of flowed from that. So really the social cultural dimensions um, are quite key to, to understanding how um, social capital can inform uh, resilience um, and a sort of uh, community uh, uh, initiatives. Oh, why isn't this jumping? Oh, okay, there we go. Now, this also raises quite an important question. Um, so social cultural factors we've, you know, we've seen are, are quite important, but they're really challenging to work with in practice. They're really difficult to understand and to articulate. Um, this is quite a complex terrain. Um, so if this raises the question, if the quality of relationships, you know, was shifting over time through this initiative, can a focus on relationship qualities be a useful and more practical kind of entry point into this space? And, and if so, we need to understand how we can work with these in practice. So this leads me on to the final study that I'm going to present. Now, this study is under review at the moment within sustainability science. So that's the, the sort of um, the usual caveat that, um, you know, uh, it, it's not a fully formed published paper as yet, but it's on its way. Now, this study um, was based, uh, focused on community based sustainability in initiatives. And this real question about is the quality of relationships, you know, do these do does this matter? So the aims of this study were to examine the qualities of social relationships and their role in these um, community initiatives and really start thinking about the implications for practice. So the methods used were participatory relationship mapping. So um, participants were asked to select um, some uh, relationships to focus on. So we weren't focused on all of their relationships. We sort of took a, a selection of relationships and use them to structure semi-structured interviews. So we did the relationship mapping and then within the, in the interviews, the relationship mapping that was undertaken by interviewees uh, was used to structure those discussions and then probe further in to not just who the relationships were with, but what the factors were involved in those relationships, what made them useful, what made them, you know, uh, problematic. So, you know, we looked at the, the positives and maybe the slightly more negative aspects from the perspective of the interviewees. So uh, 22 diverse community based sustainability initiatives were involved um, and uh, the aim was and achieved mostly was that at least two uh, members of those community groups were involved in the interviews, um, often individually, um, one, one sort of uh, was a sort of group interview. Um, so we wanted to get just not just one perspective from a community group. Um, uh, you know, we wanted to get at least at least two from the core group of people sort of driving forward that those initiatives. Now, the analysis really focused on the, those, these narrative examples that were provided by um, interviewees um, and a sort of, you know, analyzing sort of those key examples that they provided and the, the sort of deep discussions um, that were found within the interview transcripts. So I just wanted to show you an example of one. I mean, these relationship mappings were hugely diverse, um, but this is just one example of, uh, you know, what an interviewee uh, produced um, at the start of the interview. Um, and I sort of walked away and left them to it to sort of identify which relationships they'd be interested in talking about um, and really sort of um, organizing some of their thoughts. Now, this was really useful, as I say, because it moved beyond um, spending the whole time in the interview just talking about the type of actors that were involved in these relationships. Um, the interview focused on those kind of factors and, and sort of aspects of the relationships, you know, what was making them useful, why were they useful, you know, what features were involved, et cetera. So the analysis was uh, slightly, it was quite a, a sort of um, a long process um, and there was lots of different um, sort of steps involved, but broadly speaking, the first stage of the analysis looked at, okay, what are the relationship qualities we're talking about? Um, and then uh, what are the direct benefits coming out of these relationships? Uh, direct contributions, sorry, coming out of these relationships. And then how are these 
relationships contributing to wider benefits for building the initiative. So the sort of internal architecture of the initiative, but also for progressing um, the initiative towards its um, intended objective. Um, so we looked at these different aspects first and foremost, and then the second stage looked at how these aspects interrelated, how are these connecting? And this is where the narrative examples became really quite core because it identified the certain connections um, and, and these were analyzed. And then finally, the third, third stage of the analysis was looking at some of the underlying views that initiatives actors held about how relationships developed. And this actually became quite core to um, how uh, initiatives were approaching relationships that we'll get onto um, shortly. So hopefully, um, I mean, there's an awful lot to this study. Um, so I'm, I'm going to sort of skip over quite quickly some aspects of this, um, but we can come back to some of these things in the questions if necessary. So three types of relationship quality were, were identified. So the first was tense relationship qualities. Now, this is where relationships exist, but they're considered quite tense and difficult. There's a sort of, a, the, the features are it's quite sort of, there's quite a lot of friction and there's quite a lot of potential for confrontation. And it really feels like the, the, the sort of actors are almost pulling in different directions. Now, the second type of uh, relationship qualities was pragmatic relationship qualities. And these is where the social relationships and the features involved um, were really sort of created a sort of asymmetric uh, space um, where there's sort of um, unequal power dynamics and unequal benefits. One, one party feels like they're getting more from, from the relationship than the other. Um, they can be quite purpose-driven, sort of a very specific sort of um, goal in mind, um, sort of you know, expectation. Um, but they were also often experienced as quite inauthentic, slightly paternalistic. Um, yeah, sort of uh, not ideal, but a kind of necessary uh, type of relationships. And then the third type of relationship qualities were supportive relationship qualities. Now, these are relationships that created spaces that were considered as very helpful. There was an equalness to sort of uh, equality involved. You know, both actors felt that they were equally heard and listened to and could contribute. Um, these spaces were quite responsive to different needs of the actors involved, and it involved sort of respect, integrity, honesty, um, and real willingness to explore new ideas as well. Um, so it's not necessarily um, uh, just a positive space, you know, new ideas and challenges, you know, occurred in these spaces, um, but it was very much a sort of space for growth. Now, what was also identified was that we have these three different types of relationship quality, but these aren't static. So the quality of relationships with some actors uh, was shown to shift over time. Um, so again, like I said, these, you know, really sort of emphasizes the dynamic quality of relationships by looking at these qualities. Um, so pragmatic uh, qualities could sometimes shift to very supportive qualities between um, actors over time. Um, so there was a variety of different sort of changes that were identified in the quality of relationships by the actors, um, the interviewees. So very briefly, uh, the direct contributions, things that came directly from these relationships. So four different contribution types are identified. And again, broadly speaking, I don't think this is going to be um, particularly uh, different from uh, you know, a lot of people's understandings of sort of things that come out of so, uh, social capital and, and, and sort of the outcomes of social capital. Um, there was the knowledge contributions. So whether this was new ideas or knowledge, you know, products like reports, um, sort of sharing of expertise, those kind of things. There was psychological um, contributions, and this was very much about sort of being energized, enthusiasm, inspiration, um, ability to reflect, those kind of aspects. There was gatekeeping, which was this kind of introduction, sort of um, uh, helping someone access something that they could previously you know had difficulty accessing um, and then the physical kind of aspects to it you know whether that's uh, you know uh, meeting rooms equipment um, people to sort of you know volunteers manpower that kind of thing 
So then there was the different benefits. So this is in part shaped by social relationships and what directly comes out of them. So, of you know, strong, strong sort of, you know, emphasis on the fact that social relationships were not considered to be the only thing, but these were benefits that arose that social relationships help, helped to bring about. Um, so there was benefits arising for relationships, for building the initiatives, as I said, the kind of internal architecture, sort of organizing future activities, um, new funding bids, um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, identifying new people to connect with, um, those kind of things. And then this new insights about how um, to enhance the role of relationships, so kind of a sort of like more of a learning kind of aspect to it about the relationships involved. And then there was also benefits for progressing towards the initiative objective. So it was the ability to spread ideas out, you know, coming from the initiatives to, to sort of, you know, a, a broad range of people within the community. Um, there was the ability to influence formal decision making in these sort of formal spaces, uh, you know, a, a local government level, for example. Um, there was the ability to shift how sustainability issues and people are viewed. So really looking at how different um, local challenges are interconnected and how um, also uh, different people can come together and work together. Um, and then also uh, the sort of physical aspects of a community initiative, you know, uh, creating a polytunnel, um, creating a new community cafe, those physical aspects um, of a community initiative that are really key for bringing people together um, to kind of share ideas and sort of create that collective capacity. So the key thing I'd like to emphasize here is these were broadly spread across, um, you know, most of the interviewees identified these features in one way or another. Um, but the new insights about how to enhance the role of social relationships for initiatives was actually really only a few um, initiatives were sort of um, identified this as a core benefit um, that they got through relationships for building their initiative. And this is really focusing on learning about how social relationships are important, how they're supporting and feeding into an initiative um, and how to work with them. So it was very much only a few um, initiatives were engaging and getting these benefits um, uh, you know, that they identified in, in, in the interviews. Now, I've also um, highlighted the influencing formal decision-making benefit for progressing initiatives there was far fewer initiatives who identified this benefit, but I think that's predominantly about the focus of the initiatives were um, often on the community level and far fewer were looking to engage in formal decision making um, and with the sort of, you know, the, the sort of local government. Um, so um, that's that's probably why that one is less well represented. So looking at the role of um, relationship qualities, so we did a sort of, uh, this is a sort of graphical illustration of the findings. Um, and what we uh, found was unsurprisingly tense relationships have very limited contribution. So they provide some knowledge um, for initiative actors, um, but really that's, that's kind of where the, uh, the role of tense quality relationships really sort of stops. You know, it can provide a limited um, contribution, uh, limited, uh, direct contribution, and it really has very little benefit for, for initiatives more broadly. Now, pragmatic relationship provided a lot more diverse direct contributions. So, but again, there was a strong emphasis on the knowledge that came from pragmatic relationship qualities. Um, you know, that was the predominant one. There was also some gatekeeping and sort of physical contributions that came out um, of pragmatic relationships qualities. Um, and the benefits were, you know, they, this provided some benefit to uh, community initiatives, but it was quite quite focused on a few sort of specific benefit types. So pragmatic relationship qualities help feed through um, and inform um, the ability of uh, a community initiative to organize future activities, for example, to build that sort of architecture, that, that sort of internal structure of initiatives and help them grow. Um, and also pragmatic relationship qualities sort of help him, helped inform progress the progress initiatives towards their objectives in terms of kind of the distribution or spread of ideas. 
Now, looking at the role of uh, supportive relationship qualities, um, again, unsurprisingly, these provided multiple types of contribution. Um, so it was knowledge, psychological contributions, gatekeeping and physical contributions. And in turn, these help to enable multiple different benefits that you know, were in part um, you know, supported by these, these type of relationship qualities. So a huge, um, you know, much greater diversity of uh, potential that could come through supportive relationship qualities to support community initiatives. Um, so again, this is about you know, learning how to sort of you know, who, to, who to connect with, but also, um, uh, a few uh, initiatives really uh, use supportive relationship qualities to gain insights on the role of relationships within their initiative. So learning our oh, you know, supportive relationships provide us a lot more. They have a greater potential for our initiative, um, uh, you know, and learning about that, that role and the relationship qualities. Um, but this again was far fewer um, initiatives really focused on this. So um, psychological um, aspects of supportive relationships was the key difference between the other qualities. Um, the psychological aspect is that kind of um, sort of ability to infuse, inspire, um, you know, energize action within community initiatives. Um, and as I said, um, far fewer uh, initiatives identified the benefit of new insights on the role of relationships, whereas all the other benefits were quite broadly distributed across the community initiatives were quite commonplace. So just moving quickly on to the views on how relationships were, um, how relationships developed. So underlying a lot of the discussion, some uh, sort of uh, understandings of, uh, of the interviewees, they expressed different understanding about how relationships developed. So the first three type, the types of views were quite commonly held across the initiatives. So the first view was that actually it was all to do with the attitudes and behaviours of the two actors involved in those interactions. How they behaved within those interactions was critical to how those interactions unfolded, okay, which is hard to argue with. Now, another view was, um, yeah, it's about the actors, but it's also about the concerns of the actors. So what is the goal of the actors involved? Um, and if there's a shared sort of uh, concern, a shared goal, then this is more conducive for developing relationships around. Um, institutional context of the interactants was also another view that was widely shared across the initiatives. So this is, um, and a, a great example is probably with a local authority or local government. Um, so the certain cultures, certain organizational cultures um, that uh, were seen as, well, this person would, would be able to interact with us, but they're working or operating embedded within a certain culture that can help or hinder those interactions. Um, so so they haven't got time or they don't prioritize uh, relationships with communities, for example, those kind of you know, institutional um, environments, those social environments of some actors was considered super important. Now, the fourth type of view on how relationships developed um, was about the selective action of the initiative actors. OK, so this is about uh, focusing on. The, the, the initiative actors and how they interacted and behaved and, and sort of really how they were more strategic in their engagement with um, potential opportunities to build relationships. Um, so they explore and sort of, you know, opportunities and they pursue opportunities they feel are worthwhile um, to support and to feed into their initiative. So it's the really selective opportunity selection you know that they yes we'll focus here and we won't focus here that kind of so it was more driven about the sort of focus on the initiative actors and what they did um, now this was really um, not widely um, sort of found across the initiatives but a few initiatives kind of really had this approach so I just want to emphasize that that you know the other uh, uh, sort of views were, were widespread whereas this one was less widespread. So the key messages from the this study is that supportive qualities are really, really critical because they provide more diverse contributions and potential benefits. So they're able to contribute potentially and, and sort of uh, feed into more aspects um, of initiatives. And, and, and by doing so, they create, a, they, they sort of embody uh, flexibility. 
you know, the different sort of contributions, different um, aspects can be drawn on through these um, relationship qualities. So some initiatives had a strong focus on the expected benefits from um, the different actors in how they approach relationships. So they focus on that sort of first, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, the third set of findings I presented. So there was relationship qualities, direct contributions and benefits to um, initiatives. And a lot of initiatives kind of focused on that kind of those interconnections and really focused on building relationships based on what they expected to get out of those relationships or what they hope to get out of those relationships. Now, a few other initiatives um, learnt through relationships about the quality of relationships. So this is a good quality relationship. It's providing me, um, you know, the, the initiative It's providing a lot of different um, things that can help us in, in our endeavors um, and therefore understanding the role of different qualities in relationships was enhanced by learning as they experience those qualities of relationships, particularly supportive uh, qualities. So views on how relationships also uh, varied on how relationships developed, as I said. So in addition to a few initiatives really learning about the quality of relationships, there were also an often very similar uh, initiatives were also taking this explicit focus on building relationship qualities. So they were doing this selective kind of approach of pursuing opportunities they felt for supportive relationships and bypassing what they thought might be tense relationship qualities, you know, and stuck in those kind of tense um, sort of uh, situations or, or, or even to some extent pragmatic qualities. So they were focusing their efforts um, on building strategies based on the quality of relationship rather than the benefits and the actors involved. So from this study, sort of two broadly different strategies can be identified for engaging um, with relationships in community initiatives. So the first is based on this expected benefits and the type of actors involved. Um, so, you know, initiative actors, um, you know, may well and often do um, interact with other actors to embody those supportive relationship qualities, okay? So that's an important part of this. Obviously, if you want to develop supportive relationship qualities, then engaging with relationships to embody those qualities was really critical. So they, you know, engage with a sense of respect, integrity, honesty, and they embraced opportunities. Um, However, um, they also understood, um, you know, had sort of understandings about how relationships developed and the different factors involved. So uh, again, the understanding was that, you know, the actors involved are important, um, shared concerns are important, if we've got similar goals, and also the institutional context was really important. And how they, you know, acted, they did, you know, sometimes select opportunities and, and I think there is always a, a, a sort of selection of opportunities that happens you know which relationships are worth pursuing but this sort of selection was based primarily on the need of the initiative and the expected benefits that might arise so opportunities to develop relationships with different actors were undertaken but the type of relationship qualities the qualities of these relationships were really diverse so they had a landscape often of relationships with different qualities so there were supportive relationships that were there but there was also lots of pragmatic type of relationship qualities and tense relationship qualities okay so these qualities they may shift um, as sort of interactions um, progress and, and sort of external factors come to play. Um, but that's really not driven um, so much by the initiative. It's really sort of um, through experience and, and sort of learning of the both of the actors involved. Um, and there was a few examples of that. Um, so yeah, relationships um, are there, they're being pursued, um, they're different quality, and therefore the contributions of the social relationships, the landscape of social relationships they have varies greatly, okay? So some will contribute more than others. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very diverse mixed picture, okay? So, so the, yeah, they have uh, 
social relationships will help an initiative you know through these strategies of course they will um there's going to be sort of you know uh, benefits and opportunities to progress the goals um and to also sort of build the architecture of uh, community initiatives but as i said it's a bit of a mixed picture now in contrast to that another sort of approach can be identified and this is the relationship based strategies based explicitly on quality so again you've got sort of um, initiative actors you know seeking to and engaging in ways that embody a sense of respect integrity honesty you know embracing opportunities for new ideas um, again the understanding about the different factors involved in how relationships develop so again there's you know, quite a nuanced understanding of like the, the fact that these are um, sort of uh, relationship relationships of spaces that are influenced by lots of different factors um, now, there's a willingness, again, to sort of engage with relationship building opportunities. You know, relationships are recognized as important. But what the difference here is that that, that willingness um, and that sort of the engagement with relationships is really driven primarily by seeking out quality relationships. So they're being driven by quality um, more so than uh, what uh, they expect to get from um, sort of relationship so those expected benefits and focusing on a specific type of actors okay so this selection um, in addition to the insights they are gaining through their experience of relationships enables them to select certain opportunities um, for supportive relationship qualities to develop so what this brings about is a landscape of relationships that are kind of dominated by supportive qualities. I mean, you're always going to have one or two, uh, you know, there's the, you know, to, to sort of get a full landscape of supportive qualities um, is unlikely because these um, initiatives are quite dynamic and shifting and you're testing out uh, sort of opportunities. But the key message here is that it is they're able to build up this landscape of relationships that are really dominated by supportive qualities. And this has really important implications for the community resili uh, community um, initiatives because it provides them with the flexibility to draw on different, um, get different contributions from different places and sort of actors based in different contexts. Um, and it just really creates that flexibility and diversity um, that's really, really critical. So, the contributions made by these relationships with other factors, you know, has a much greater role for, you know, it provides a sort of a much stronger role for social relationships within these initiatives. And this role, you know, can help progress the, the initiative towards the goals and, and, and sort of create greater impact, but it can also help sort of um, build up the initiative and sort of, you know, increase and expand the initiative um, and sort of strengthen it, um, you know, in terms of its internal kind of architecture as well so these are two very different um strategies um and um, i'm not saying sort of you know uh, one strategy was always pursued and you know, you know it, it's a bit of a spectrum um but these two very different strategies can can be identified from this this research so the key message is um, the role of relationships and community initiatives can be strengthened by focusing on qualities rather than expected benefits now, human agency, so this willingness to engage and ability to engage with social relationships and the learning that arises from relationships, so that learning about the qualities and what the qualities are sort of, you know, helping with in terms of the initiative um, can enable um, uh, initiatives to strategically work through relationships. So it's about this interplay between agency collective agency to pursue relationships and pursue the quality of relationships the learning from experiencing those relationship qualities um you know kind of you know, and that selective approach um can really maximize the role of relationships in in community um, initiatives and actually this creates a reinforcing loop that builds collective capacity if you're learning and you're pursuing quality relationships you're increasing you know that landscape of relationship qualities so that it's more supportive and this creates the flexibility and therefore more capacity to be able to work through relationships and with different groups um, so this has you know this this research did also raise a couple of questions and uh, the aspects that were beyond the scope of this research I didn't get a chance to dig into the institutional context, so that inst the organizational culture of formal actors. Um, and this sort of strand of research kept picking this up as the sort of 
formal formal organizations are important, um, but there really is opportunities for future research around the cultures within um, sort of organizations um, and how that can help or hinder the development of relationship qualities and sort of you know social capital more broadly. Um, some aspects of uh, cultures will help, some will hinder, but really how do we create more support, you know, uh, institutional cultures that, that really help this kind of uh, sort of social capital, social relationships and, and the quality of social relationships develop. And finally, another interesting question that arose through this research that wasn't covered in the scope of this, this um, the study, but is quite an interesting one for future, is that the scope of these initiatives did vary greatly. Um, some of them were focused on very specific single issues, and some of them were more focused on sort of very broad problem domains, like environmental sustainability. And there's an interesting question of how the scope of initiatives influence the ability um, uh, of, of community initiatives to take that selective approach. Um, if they've got a very narrow specific um, sort of objective and therefore potentially see a very narrow set of actors who they should be engaging with, you know, how does that interact with their ability to uh, create quality relationships and really develop up that kind of agency and um, capacity to really sort of um, address the, the, and, and progress their, their initiatives as well. So there's some, some interesting questions that have been thrown up as well from this research. So just to sort of conclude, um, I've sort of presented sort of three, three studies in this talk. Um, the first study, which was the review, really highlighted, amongst many other things, the need to better engage with the social cultural dimensions involved in shaping the role of social relationships, okay? So it's not just about the connections, it's also about those other less tangible factors involved that shapes how relationships unfold, what they do, what emerges, et cetera. So looking at these multiple you know, social cultural factors uh, for different social groups, uh, study two um, looked at sort of uh, the interactions between an initiative team, um, the place um, and how this influenced and, and on also um, sort of you know, business actors um, and how these interacted, um, the different factors involved to influence the quality of relationships within this initiative and how it progressed and how the role um, and how sort of uh, relationships guided the development of the initiative over time. And it really emphasized the fact that social cultural factors are really important um, and they really do shape how the quality of relationship changes through these initiatives and therefore how relationships are able to contribute um, and sort of help or, or you know, hinder the development of an initiative. So the third study looked at sort of a, a lot broader, different kind of um, community initiatives. And there was an explicit focus on this study on relationship qualities as a potentially key entry point in to working through relationships in a more practical context, recognizing that social cultural factors are really important, but really challenging to work with. Um, so basically um, you know, the study is, is kind of um, a key message from this study is that relationship qualities are worth focusing on. They can increase the role of uh, social relationships over time within an initiative, um, but really it highlights the importance of the connection between human agency and learning about relationships um, to achieve this in practice. Great, um, and, and that's the, the final slide. So um, I'll draw it to an end. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Esther. Fascinating presentation. We've had uh, quite a few people in the chat indicating how much they enjoyed what uh, what you presented, and certainly three three fascinating studies there. Uh, so we'll have some questions now. We've got about uh, ten or fifteen minutes for for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, you can either post them in the chat. I'd be happy to read them out on your behalf, or you can raise your hand within Zoom, um, and when you're called upon, you can unmute yourself to to ask your question. Uh, so the first question looks like is coming from Yvonne. Feel free to unmute yourself. Well, I am Yvonne, Dr. Yvonne Greer from Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the United States. And I have to say, even though I'm up at, uh, it started at four o'clock, I am just rejuvenated by this presentation. I wrote down a few things because I felt that it really, hit on some of the work that I'm doing, um, working with the state of Wisconsin, a governmental agency. I have a private practice business. Um, I, 
doctor of public health, but a, a registered dietitian. Um, but I also lead coalitions and we're doing much work to really look at social determinants of health and promoting the community and centering on community voice and having the community be an active player in everything. But one one couple things was that um, the idea of a sense of belonging, creating that more sense of belonging and shared power. But one thing um, it also can do is to address or um, impact trauma and distrust. Because at many times in working with the community, there is a distrust of institutions. And so that valuing the sense of belonging and the, uh, uh, and the importance of developing those relationships is important. But what I found was that the state is reaching out and saying that they value the benefit of having the community voice, having the involvement, but they have not really invested as much into the quality of the relationship. So they do come to people like me in the community to try to bridge that gap between the quality and the distrust that they don't have in institutions and the community people that's involved. So one of the things that I, when you were talking about it, I thought, how much um, value is it to have those community champions involved to bridge the gap between institutions and the community? Because I, I do believe, um, I totally understand the quality of the relationship versus just being in the community and having community involvement. And it seemed like that first model um, with all of those landscapes and different people and then going into that supportive more, um, having more supportive people. I know the last program we did, we actually vetted who to invite. And I think it's because of the quality of the relationship that some of us had and we were bringing in those people that we knew we already had relationship with. So can you kind of speak to were there some type of selections of the leaders within the community and their relationships and how that relationship had a difference in shaping, you know, the the impact of, of um, building on that um, acceptance of what you were doing. Because in the beginning, you know, people were not accepting, especially I'm thinking about the refrigerator and then over time things, started changing versus the idea that it's a good thing to do and everybody should just love it yeah so thank you thank you very much Yvonne um so I think this really does speak to the the second study as you highlight that community fridge study because basically the the sort of team involved were acting as that link as that sort of connection between these different actors so um with the business community but also with local authorities and you know there's lots of different people who are relevant um, in terms of sort of developing these initiatives so I do think we we've got to be careful when we're talking about community that we do focus on these sort of key people within the community these leaders who can provide those connections you know I mean often these these initiatives are voluntary as well you know um, so we need to make the best use of resources and focusing on those people who um, sort of maybe intuitively understand that it's about quality of engagement um, so um, I think that's really, really critical. And if we're going to be doing some sort of capacity enhancement campaigns or, you know, uh, programs, then focusing in on those people is really, really critical. But I think what it, the study also showed is what's behind the ability of those people to engage in sort of those supportive relationship qualities and build them is about their values and their sort of, um, sort of uh, you know, how they approach it and how they um, recognize the importance of these people. So you embody those qualities, but you understand and you're driven by these people, that these business community is an important part of our community and we want to include them. So um, I think that's quite a critical dynamic a, a sort of aspect of, of selecting some people to really represent and provide that sort of connection um, to other actors um, so yeah I think I think it's really critical I think the quality is important but also understanding the factors involved 
um, that, that kind of really drive that. And the only other comment I wanted to say was that I work with grant programs and so they give you a certain amount of time to do whatever and it's already dictated so when you say relationships happen over time sometimes the time of the grant doesn't facilitate um, the real time that it takes to make those real um, quality relationships mm, absolutely I'd agree it's yeah huge problem we need to build these things up sort of in advance and, and maintain them and that takes time and effort thank you Great, thanks, Yvonne. Uh, the next question is from Shirley. Hi, thanks, Tristan. It's Cheryl. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, <laughs> thank you, um, Esther, so much for that. Um, I, I managed to to understand most of it, although I'm not um, an expert in this topic. I've sort of stumbled into it over the last couple of years, working with young people and almost trying to bridge between corporates and um, and young people. And one of the I've kind of stumbled across this because I've recognised that in particular some young people, particularly young people from certain backgrounds, do seem to struggle even when a door is opened to walk through that door, right, if that makes sense. And so I've then delved more into this topic. So my question really is, um, in, in your views, and I don't know whether any of the studies um, is particular help in this respect, but what, what can employers do to support entry level employees um, so, so I'm thinking, you know, your apprentices, um, new grads, particularly if they're first, first gen grads, so maybe the first people to go to uni, um, to, you know, to be more aware of what social capital is and how it has an impact, not just on obviously, you know, personal lives in the community, but particularly um, an impact on their careers. Um, but how do they do that in a way that allows them to maintain a sense of agency? Because what I have seen in some organisations is, you know, people are assigned a mentor or a buddy or they're almost like, you know, told that they've got to go and do this, that and the other. And it just doesn't always seem to work out. So, you know, ba based on what you've seen in those community studies, what is the best way of almost like imparting or um, equipping young people with? the information that they need to make those decisions for themselves, those informed decisions. Okay, so so I think the advice I would be giving uh, based on, on this research is it is really important how you engage with other people, you know, that it go, it, it almost feels like it, it, it's, it's so obvious, but it really does, uh, it's really important to emphasize this, particularly with young people who are, you know, underconfident, sort of, um, you know, can be slightly uh, apologetic sometimes, uh, just under, underconfident. I mean, I remember it, it's so well. <laughs> um, so really emphasizing how you engage with other people is whoop, really important. Sorry, my light's just gone out. There we go. Um, <laughs> um, but also it's, you know, a relationship is about two people engaging. Um, and, you know, it's important for the other person to also engage in, in that way. Um, and, you know, if that happens and you have got a quality relationship uh, with other people and just to really emphasize a lot of these quality, supportive relationship qualities you know, were within communities, uh, with uh, between communities and uh, you know formal organisations. They were across contexts. Okay, um, so yes, the context matters, but actually, the way that people engage is really critical. Okay, um, and the benefits that can provide for exploring ideas, sharing ideas. Um, you know, it's almost a supportive relationship quality can create a safe space for growth and learning. You know, and it can be a space to go. Oh, I disagree with that, you know, and have those sort of challenging conversations, but not in, in a way that closes things down. OK, so that's the potential for relationships, why they're potentially important. Yeah. But in practice, yes, other people might not engage with you in those ways and create that space for you. And it is more difficult for young people. They have got less agency and opportunities to be selective. But I think understanding that they can be selective and bypass opportunities that are frustrating and you're feeling like you're banging your head against a brick wall um, and it can really drain you, seek out those opportunities, energize and uh, have the potential to create those learning spaces. Um, don't be afraid to kind of go, yeah, okay, this one isn't, you know, quite living up to the potential. Go and seek another mentor. Um, you know, it's, it's so it's making them aware that they can have agency and they need to build that agency. Right. But um, yeah, um, I think just setting that out 
would really help people say oh you need to go network and you're just like well you know I don't get it <laughs> so yeah that would be my advice yeah. that's really interesting what you just said there in, in terms of for example if they're assigned a mentor you know saying to them if it doesn't work out feel free to find another one you know that's something that's been told to me in my career so actually why don't we think of telling young people the same thing so that's really interesting yeah yeah thank you yeah great thanks Cheryl uh who would like to who else would like to ask a question feel free to raise your hand or post in the chat if you have one while we're waiting to see if anyone else has a question um Esther, I was, I was wondering, in, in study two, uh, was there any deliberate attempt to try to set the narrative or to communicate with the existing business owners uh, in the neighbourhood about the fridge? Because um, it seemed like it very quickly got out of hand and they, they positioned themselves as a, you know, a, a group that was in opposition to, to this initiative. And as soon as they did that, there was an in-group and an out-group and they found solidarity in that. But of course, that was in opposition to the initiative. So I was just wondering if you were aware of any any deliberate attempt to try to 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 communicate with the business owners at the start of the project. So what what was really interesting about this, it did very quickly get out of hand. And what was interesting was um, there was already a sort of uh, relationship between the the team and business owners, um, and so information was conveyed almost in quite an informal um, setting. Um, based on those existing relationships um, and it was piecemeal and it was a little bit of information and it allowed people the business owners to then go away and go oh um, and you know start the interpretation um, and you know bring in their assumptions etc so one of the key things that could have maybe uh, reduced the likelihood of this really getting so out of hand um, was setting the narrative much more clearly at the start um, and really being a lot more um, strategic about communication and this narrative about this is who we are, this is what we're trying to achieve, these are important principles of you know supporting businesses, engaging with people, um, creating this space for people to come together to create, um, to address climate change, you know, and there would still be questions because it's a novel new idea, but it would have uh, allowed some of those gaps to be filled in by the narrative driven by the team rather than this kind of piecemeal approach, really. Um, and what was interesting at the end of the process, the, some of the businesses said, we want to help you with your narrative. And if you're doing a community fridge elsewhere, let we'll come and we'll 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 be your cheer champions. We'll we'll say this is good for businesses. Um, so it really sort of feeds back into the importance of really um, thinking about your narrative and your communication. Really, um, so yeah, that would be one one sort of key message from this. And it happens all too frequently that the, the narrative gets out of hand, and then you you end up with this, these kind of oppositions that that aren't founded in in anything that's real. Uh, it's all perceived, and you get these really strong formations of identity groups and solidarity forming in response to them. And I think it's it's probably what you described as where there's informal relationships, and so there's a bit of a drip feed of little bits of information that come out. That's probably it. Seems to be the situation where that arises the most. You know, the, the alternative, of course, is where there's there's virtually no information at all. The, the project isn't communicating with the local community, and that can also go astray quite quickly if once the little bits of information start to arrive. Um, but of course, the alternative is to be upfront and to engage with the community. And that's clearly the process that tends to be most effective. Mm -hmm. So that there's clearly some lessons here for all of us, um, regardless of what work we're doing um, across the board, you know, regardless of how we're, we're dealing with and working with community, it's, it's clearly a really important message. Mm. And I think it's I think it's really easy to forget because we get quite excited when we're leading these initiatives. We go, oh, we're going to do this. And it's really exciting. You know, the team I was working with are deeply excited. But I think their excitement um, clouded them to the fact that other people wouldn't necessarily be excited. And, and change can be quite scary for a lot of people. And, you know, sort of recognizing that people will have different perspectives and they need to listen and understand concerns and show that they're actively engaging with them I think is really important but the emotions behind some of the change uh, processes who's involved and, and what their role is is really important I would say um, so yeah that was quite a fascinating part of the process 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm not seeing any other questions pop up. There's a few people here who submitted questions in advance. If you still want to ask those questions, please raise your hand or post in the chat. Uh, I did have one other thing to ask you about, Esther, which is that it seems to me that the uh, the two, uh, the second and third study that you, you presented, um, if you'd used a social capital lens, or certainly the commonly used social capital lenses on those studies, you couldn't have got the kind of results you got, I don't think. Um, you know, the, you highlighted in the first one how the, the sociocultural aspects are not commonplace in, in the social capital literature. Do you have any ideas about why that is and perhaps what we could do about it even um, to encourage people to focus on those sociocultural aspects of social capital? Well, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I did find the social capital lens, uh, you know, as a, the first study shows the review, I did I did sort of approach this first and foremost through a social capital lens. And and the landscape of social capital um, is quite complex and there are different understandings and different approaches and dominant ways of uh, sort of, you know, um, uh, you know epistemologies and, and things like that. Um, so I just I just found it. Um, I was going to tie myself up in in knots a little bit um, and it didn't afford me the space to really explore those different aspects. Um, I mean, social cultural aspects are really challenging. They're diverse. They, they vary from place to place. Um, so, yeah, it is it is challenging to to kind of work through them. But I felt that, that yeah, social relationships as a core component of social capital. I don't think what I've done is um, it doesn't align. I think it aligns quite nicely, actually. But I'm just not taking those four more sort of uh, sort of more structurally orientated understandings of social capital. Um, so I think, I mean, I know more hybrid understandings of social capital are emerging that emphasize more those social cultural aspects. Um, and I would really say that they are quite critical to, to explore. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's often, you need to think about that in your research design. Um, you know, how, how do we sort of, I mean, at a population level, for example, social cultural aspects are gonna be A, difficult and B, um, you know, they're so context specific that it's gonna be like almost meaning, meaningless to kind of you know, apply that at that level. Um, but at a more localized level, I think it becomes super important and a lot easier to do that. Um, so you could, you, I think, you know, there is room to do it from a social capital sort of lens using that more, slightly more deductive aspect, but really focusing on these underplayed kind of as, aspects of social capital and just bringing them out much more strongly. Um, I think it could work. Yeah, I completely agree with you, what you said, that, that, that I don't see any conflict here at all between what you've done in second and third study and what social capital is all about, of course. Um, I guess the, the point that you make and I make it and I agree with as well is that if you used narrowly used the social capital lens as it's used by 95% perhaps of the literature, then there isn't space there for you to really focus on those things that came out uh, and understand you know, um, empathy and some of these kinds of things. Of course, unless you we're using Lyndon Robison's approach to social capital. But, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff there that I was seeing in the second and third study that I don't think could have really emerged if you'd used the lens of social capital as it's so commonly used. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some opportunities here for social capital researchers to, to, cons to, to look at what you've done and to consider how they may be able to conceptualise social capital in a way that's capable of, of this rich um, understanding of the, the sociocultural context. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there was one question that's popped up in the chat where over time, so perhaps this will be the last one. Is it um, dative, dative? If you'd like to unmute yourself, you're welcome to. Or I, or I can read it on your behalf if you like. Uh, so the question is, I want to ask uh, that I believe that social relationships help some of the benefits include create social capital that helps them run their businesses, but sometimes create conflicts that leads to their disappointments. Um, why do you think this happens? Well, I think this speaks directly to the different qualities of relationships, um, you know, particularly if we talk, think about um, tense relationship qualities. Uh, so the question is, I want to ask. 
task uh, that I believe mm -hmm. that social relationships um, so I think, yeah, so I think the assumption that all social relationships are good is a, is a wrong assumption, um, that, that some you know, relationships can be, uh, can create confrontation, conflict, which we can learn from, of course, but um, they're very frustrating. They're not very um, uh, providing um, a, a lot to feed into action and to really energize and, and sort of uh, move things forward. Um, so yeah, of course, relationships can be really challenging and difficult. And we do need to recognize that just because we have a relationship, it doesn't mean it's particularly uh, positive and um, you know conducive for for growth, whether that be through a community initiative or you know um, in other contexts. Um, so I think yes, uh, relationships are important, but let's not forget that not all relationships are equal, um, and uh, we need to work out how to focus on the more positive, creating those more positive, supportive spaces. Um, and bypassing and reducing that potential for frustration and conflict that that happens. But you know, let's not let let's try and focus our efforts on on slightly more supportive spaces. Um, I think is one of the key messages I'd say. Yeah, great. All right, thanks very much for the for the webinar. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating, and I think I'm sure everybody uh, will agree that it's it's um, really enjoyed it. So thanks very much for your time. I uh, look forward to, to seeing your, your third paper being published and getting an opportunity to read it. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed this. So yeah, best wishes to everyone.